and welcome everyone to the second part of our 23rd lecture for Math 353. This is a lecture that is meant to be viewed. It is recorded for our normal meeting session of Wednesday, April the 1st. I will start adding the date that these lectures are associated with into the notes so that students have that reference and can help them hopefully to keep up with what happened when. I also want to mention that in the last video that we recorded, the first part of lecture 23, I believe I had left the air pump on for my desk aquarium, and so if there's an annoying rattle in that video, I apologize for that. I'm going to go ahead and move my little aquarium off of my desk so that if I do forget to turn the filter off again, or rather the air pump, it will not affect the video quality, so apologies for that. You can know that my blue beta that I have here on my desk is lovely, and he does enjoy oxygen in his water. So today we are going to start on chapter 15, three of our book. This is going to be a discussion of the polar coordinate system for two dimensional integrals, double integrals. And this is going to be our first non-Cartesian coordinate system. And we'll talk more about what we mean by that phrase shortly. So coordinate systems in general are ways of labeling the points in the plane or in three space or in four space or whatever dimension Euclidean space you happen to be working in. But they're, they're equivalent to, or they're analogous to the addresses that we have for our homes. So if I tell you that my apartment is at uh, apartment two at 123 Fake Street, if you know where Fake Street is, you can find address 123 and you can go into apartment two and be exactly where I live. It's a way of pinpointing the location of things in such a way that the locations are unambiguous when described in this way. That's what coordinate systems amount to. So the way that we usually think about the plane is, is these ordered pairs, these xy pairs. If I give you point one three, you know that that means that you start at the origin, you move right a distance of one, and then you move up a distance three. And then you can draw the point in the plane that we are referring to by this ordered pair one three. That's the idea. It is possible to come up with other methods for assigning addresses other than this schema of how far do I move right or left, and then how far do I move up or down? This way of moving right, left, and up, down is called rectangular coordinates or Cartesian coordinates. It's got kind of a rectangular nature to it. You can see that as you're moving right or left and then up or down. We're also going to shortly draw what are called the grid lines for this coordinate system. And the rectangular nature of the coordinate system is even more apparent when looking at the grid lines. It's also called the Cartesian coordinate system, where we capitalize the Cartesian part because it comes from a man's name, that man being Rene Descartes. So Descartes was a famous philosopher and early mathematician. He, his work in mathematics has been described as the work that had the greatest influence on Newton of any previously existing mathematics. So that alone is enough to win Descartes a place in the history books. The fact that he was, in some sense, Newton's if not mentor, at least a, a heavy influence on Newton himself. That's major because Newton is, uh, it's, it's difficult to overestimate or overstate the importance of Newton. So he came up with this idea of, of describing points using these XY ordered pairs. That was part of Descartes' contribution to mathematics. In the realm of philosophy, he is the I think therefore I am guy, even though he actually never said that exactly that way. He said essentially that, and he's famous for that. His meditations are some famous works of, of classical philosophy. He was an interesting man on a lot of different levels. He it was a military man early in his life, and later when he was a more important academic, well, there are lots of stories about Descartes, many of them likely apocryphal. But one says that he always found academic life stressful, and periodically he would have to de-stress by hiring himself out as a mercenary in whatever military conflict happened to be going on in Europe at the time. He was not concerned with the politics or morality, he just wanted to go fight somewhere. And he's quoted as saying that he had to escape the stress and the turmoil of academia and find peace and repose on the battlefield. So maybe this says something about him, that he found a battle more relaxing than the university. Maybe it says something about the university, that he found battle more relaxing than the university. There are also some horror stories. He believed that non-human animals didn't have souls and therefore couldn't feel pain. And at least once is reported to have vivisected a dog in front of a live audience, believing that the dog did not actually feel pain because it was not imbued with by the creator with an immortal soul. So... 
that is far less endearing than him finding battle less stressful than academic work. <clears throat> but moving past the fact that nobody likes a person who hurts dogs, we will return to the mathematics and we will state that what actually matters for coordinate systems is the fact that every point in the plane can be described by some xy pair. So every point in the plane has an xy pair assigned to it, and if I give you an exy pair, you know exactly which point that I'm talking about. So there's no ambiguity. Every point has a label, and every label is assigned to some point. There's no way to get the addresses wrong here. There's no, there's no multiple streets by the same name in this town or something insane of that nature. So the lack of ambiguity is an important factor. As we said, there are other schemes. There's other ways rather than this moving right and left and moving up and down. So instead of giving the x value, which is moving right and left, and the y value, which tells you how to move up or down, I could give you the radius and the angle associated with some point. So how far away from the origin is this point in question, and also what is the angle line that it lies upon? So here's a point 2, 2 in Cartesian. We know what that looks like. You move over 2, you go up 2, and you get this point right on the 45 here. To describe that same point in terms of radius and angle, I could give the angle here between the positive x-axis and the line segment that runs between the point and the origin. And there's many different points along that that are associated with that angle of pi over 4 here, or 45 degrees. But I can also tell you how far away from the origin is the point that I'm interested in. And that will then unambiguously characterize this point. So if I give you both the angle associated in this way and also the distance from the origin, then the point in question is typified. It is characterized in an unambiguous manner. I'm getting the square root of 8 here from Pythagoras' theorem. If we come over here and look at the Cartesian version, we've got a distance of 2 and we've got a distance of 2 in the vertical direction. So if we were to draw this as a triangle, it would have a base length of 2 and a height of 2. And being a right triangle, we can use Pythagoras' theorem to find the length of the radius. And in fact, that's going to be square root of 8 or 2 root 2. So instead of xy, I can give you r theta pairs. r is radius, and that is the distance from the origin to the point in question. Theta is the angle. This is the Greek letter lowercase theta, T-H-E-T-A is the pronunciation. Theta is the angle between the positive x-axis moving counterclockwise until you reach the line segment that runs from the origin to the point in question. Counterclockwise is, by convention, the positive direction in math class generally, and we will abbreviate that using the acronym CCW. So this is the idea. Instead of xy, which are the variables in Cartesian, we could use r theta, which are going to be the variables in polar coordinates. And here's a few other sketches of points and what r and theta look like for those points in polar. So here's a point. We've got theta coming up from the positive x-axis and r being the distance from the point to the origin. Here's one that's slightly more interesting where our point lies in the third quadrant. Theta has to wrap all the way around to get to here. Note that theta equal to zero gives you the positive x-axis. Theta equal to pi over two gives you the positive y-axis. Theta equal to pi is going to give you the negative x-axis. And theta equal to three pi over two would give you the negative y-axis. For this point P, uh, it doesn't have a name, let's call it P, in the third quadrant, theta is between pi and three pi over two. And R, as always, is the distance from the origin. So r is always going to be greater than or equal to zero for us. It is a distance. We do not conceive of negative distance in this course, although such strange concepts are not unknown to math, but not in this class. We will always take r greater than or equal to zero here, and we will generally think of theta as being between zero and two pi. That rule is bendy, so we might actually violate that. It is sometimes useful to think about negative values of theta. If you're dropping back just a bit into the fourth quadrant, instead of wrapping all the way around to get there, you might think of a negative theta dropping back to that point. So here we've drawn a point in the fourth quadrant, down here. You could take theta to come all the way over here, and if this is on a 45 degree angle here, that would make that theta 7 pi over 4. Or I could just drop back a distance of negative pi over 4. Both of these conceptions are useful. As a first approximation, we'll think that we usually take theta between 0 and 2 pi, but we are allowed to 
bend or break that rule if it suits our purposes. <clears throat> it is also worth noting that if you take r equal to zero, you're talking about the origin, a distance of zero from the origin. Only the origin is a distance of zero from the origin. So the equation r equal to zero, that indicates the origin, and theta is not actually defined for the origin. You could either say that no theta value is defined or that all theta points work. Those are actually fairly equivalent, but it is not something that we have to worry too much about. Just note that r equal to zero refers to the origin, and in general, we do not define the angle associated with the origin. Or if you prefer the formulation, you could say all values of theta are relevant. If you take r, like the r theta pair zero pi, that's the origin. The r theta pair zero 10 pi, that's also the origin, and so forth. You're free to do that as well. It won't be an issue in this course. Just note that r equal to zero indicates the origin. So every point in the plane can be described either in rectangular or in polar coordinates. That is sort of the, the, the core issue or the core requirement that must be satisfied to be dealing with a new coordinate system, is that all the points that you're talking about and the space that you're talking about, here it's R2, the plane, you have to be able to describe every point in that region in your new coordinate system. And we can describe every point in the plane using polar. We already knew that we could describe every point in the plane in the re using rectangular. We've been doing that likely since long before Calc 3. You can also translate between the two coordinate systems. So if somebody hands you a designation of a point in rectangular, you can translate that into a characterization of that point in polar and vice versa. So we'll have two theorems that allow us to do this. The first is given here. This is gonna tell us how to translate from rectangular to polar. <clears throat> so if I hand you an xy pair, say 7, negative 4, or any xy in rectangular, then the same point can be expressed in polar using these following two equations. So to find the r value associated with an xy point, r is going to be the square root of x squared plus y squared. This should look a whole lot like Pythagoras' theorem because it is from Pythagoras' theorem. This same equation is often useful it is often useful to bear in mind that you can re-express this as r squared equals to x squared plus y squared. So this, again, it looks like Pythagoras' theorem. It also looks like the equation for a circle. None of that is a coincidence. We will draw some pictures shortly here that'll illustrate where this comes from. For theta, given x and y, if you want to find the associated theta value, you actually have several options. And these equations are not as nice. They're gonna involve inverse trig expressions. You could write theta as cosine inverse of x over what is effectively r here, but written in terms of x and y. Or you can do it as an inverse sine function that looks similar. We've got cosine of x over the radius, sine of y over the radius, or tangent of just tan inverse, rather, of y over x. So cosine inverse, sine inverse, or tan inverse. There's expressions for theta using those three trig functions. So the... The payload here for this theorem is to say that if you're handed x and y in rectangular, the exact same point can be described in polar in this way. This is r, and this is theta in polar coordinates. And I will also note that the equation r squared equals x squared plus y squared as a connection between polar and rectangular, that equation comes up a lot. It's important, and this is one of the key equations that connect polar, oops, sorry, this is one of the key equations that connect polar to rectangular. Whereas the expressions for theta do not come up as much. We will look at a picture again and we'll see where they come from, why they have the form that they do, but they are not of as much practical importance. Definitely bear in mind that r squared equals x squared plus y squared, but the equations for theta are not as universally useful. It'll be good to know where they come from and to be able to dredge them up if needed but they're not something that I would expect you to know off the top of your hat. So, a proof of this theorem. Here is our point xy. I'm going to draw in this line segment from the origin to the point. I'm also gonna drop from the point straight down to the x-axis, giving me a vertical leg of a right triangle. And I'll also indicate the, the, <clears throat> the bottom leg of this triangle as x. So x, from my xy pair is the length of this bottom leg, y from my xy pair is the length of this vertical leg. 
Pythagoras' theorem tells me that r, the length of the hypotenuse, would have to be the square root of x squared plus y squared. What Pythagoras' theorem also actually says is that r squared equals x squared plus y squared. And I just take a square root, and in fact the positive square root, to get to this formula. This is the theta value defined for polar coordinates, and we can see that sine of theta is always opposite, or y, over hypotenuse, or r. So since th sine of theta is y over the root of x squared plus y squared, it must be true that theta is sine inverse of that ratio. And likewise, if you would like to define theta in terms of a cosine inverse, or in terms of a tangent inverse function. You can do so just looking at this picture. Tan of theta is y over x, and so theta is tan inverse of y over x, and so forth. So that is our quote unquote proof. That is how you connect the points given in rectangular, how you would translate them to an equivalent formulation in polar. And we can do the same thing going from polar to rectangular. So if somebody hands you an r theta pair, and it is the it is the characterization of a point in polar coordinates. You can write down the x value and the y value. x is going to be r cosine theta, and y is going to be r sine theta. So r theta in polar has expression r cos theta and r sine theta in rectangular. And we have a similar proof here. It's actually simpler. We don't have to do any inverse trig because we're actually trying to get to the bottom and the right legs out of this picture. We already know the hypotenuse. We already know the angle, and since sine of theta is y over r, for instance, y has to be r sine theta. The purpose of having a new coordinate system, why would we introduce polar coordinates? Granted, you can describe points in rectangular or in polar. Why would we care about that? Why would we try to have a new way of describing points? The point is that some regions are more naturally described in one coordinate system than they are in another. So there are going to be regions that we want to integrate over where the integrals are going to be very simple and polar because the region is very easily expressed in polar. Whereas the same region integrated over in rectangular might be the stuff of nightmares. So problems that are very difficult if approached in rectangular might suddenly become almost trivial if approached in polar. It really comes down to, and we'll talk more about this as we start to actually compute these integrals, but it comes down to approaching the problem on its own terms in some sense. If the region fits into polar coordinates well, then you're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole by approaching that problem in rectangular coordinates. You kind of like have to allow the regions to be expressed in an environment that they are more naturally expressed in, where they live more naturally, that is more better, that they are better suited to, and that it makes hard problems into easy problems. So I say here that the purpose is to be able to describe regions more naturally in the coordinate system which is appropriate. Ultimately, it will be to integrate over such regions in the coordinate system where the region is more naturally expressed, and it's gonna simplify some difficult integrals for us. So what we want to do at this point is we want to try to develop our intuition of what types of regions are more naturally expressed in rectangular and what types of regions are more naturally expressed in polar. How do we have a sense of, if we're handed a region, which region, which coordinate system is best for describing this region? So in order to try to develop that intuition, we are going to consider two ideas, the idea of general rectangles and also the idea of grid lines. So rectangles, what do I mean by rectangles? In Cartesian coordinates, rectangles look like rectangles. They look like what you think rectangles look like. So if we want to describe a rectangle in Cartesian analytically, the salient feature of its analytic description is that both variables are bounded by constants. So when we talked about integrals over rectangles, both of our limits of integration just had constant bounds, or all of our, rather, both of our integrals had constant limits of integration. When we thought about more general region, for double integrals, suddenly one of the variables no longer had constant bounds. So the salient feature of, of rectangles, the salient feature of rectangles there was that both variables were bounded by constants. And if we draw that geometrically, if we think about it geometrically rather than analytically, it's a region that looks like this, the thing that we grew up calling a rectangle. So here's x going from a to b. For each of those x values, y is going from c to d. And we get this blocky shape here. 
So a description of rectangles analytically in Cartesian and geometrically in Cartesian. To move from thinking about rectangles in Cartesian to thinking about rectangles in polar, we're gonna take the analytic definition of rectangles in Cartesian and we're gonna proceed analogously into polar. In particular, I'm gonna let R be bounded by two constants and theta be bounded by two constants. So we're gonna call a region in polar coordinates a polar rectangle if it can be described by bounding both of the variables involved in polar by constants. So analytically, it looks like this, and we're using alpha and beta here. The tradition is to use lowercase Greek letters to describe angles, so this is lowercase alpha, lowercase beta. You can use C and D if you really want, it's fine. But I'm using our Latin alphabet here to bound R and our Greek alphabet to bound, bound theta. So that's the analytic definition of a polar rectangle. Geometrically is where it gets interesting. So what does this region look like geometrically? Theta equal to alpha says rotate from the x-axis up to some value alpha. And then we have not specified what the radius should be. So we're taking all points, all distances from the origin as long as theta is alpha. So the line theta equal to alpha is giving me this, what could be called a half infinite radial ray. It's moving out in a radial direction and there's a ray, meaning it is a half infinite line of this type. So it stops at the origin, but it can continues off in this direction infinitely. And again, that's because I've rotated through theta and I have not specified distance from the origin. So any distance from the origin is acceptable. And I get the whole of that half infinite radial ray and then theta equal to beta is just having rotated through a larger angle to get this half infinite radiant ray, radial ray over here to the left, closer to the vertical. R equal to A is gonna say, take all points that are a distance A from the origin, and that would give me a circle uh, centered at the origin to take all points distant, all points that are distant, that have distance A from the origin. And so we're gonna have this as a portion of that circle, and then R equal to B is gonna be just a larger radius circle. So this is meant to be, you can see the dots where we continue that circle over to the axes. And this doesn't look quite as curvy as I would like, but use your imagination. These are both little sub arc lengths from the circle. So little sections cut out of a circle. And it's this shaded region here that we're referring to by this region R. So it's every value for theta, our rotation, you've gotta rotate at least alpha and no more than beta. So your angle turning is gonna place you somewhere in here. And you also have to move a distance from the origin at least A and no more than B. So pushing from this inner circle to that outer circle as little r moves from A to B. And it's this shaded region that is a polar rectangle. And here's some others. So here's my lower value for theta here. It looks like it might be about pi over four and it might be three pi over four for the upper value for theta. And we've got an inner value for little r, and we've got an upper value for little r. An inner circle, which gives us our lower bound for inner little r, and an outer circle, which gives us our upper bound for little r. That's a polar rectangle. This, is a, this washer looking shape is called an annulus, and it is also a polar rectangle. Here we have little r going from a small value, which represents the inner circle, to a large value, which represents the outer circle. And we might have theta here going from zero to pi over two, I'm sorry, from zero all the way to two pi to get the whole full rotational symmetry of this object. So this counts as a polar rectangle. Here's another polar rectangle. Here it looks like theta is going from pi to two pi and r is going from some small value out to some larger value. This is also a polar rectangle. If I just wanted the lower half of the disk, I could get that by letting r go from zero to some larger value and still letting theta go from pi to two pi, for instance. So questions are always welcome about all of this stuff. I am particularly prone to solicit questions as we begin new material, and especially as we're going through these early stages of developing intuitions. So if you have questions about this material, let me know. I'll be happy to talk to you over email or via video conference or phone. But these are what polar rectangles look like. So regions that have sort of this character Regions that are square and blocky in this way are likely to be well represented in Cartesian, and regions that have this sort of a chunk of a circle kind of character are more likely to be well represented in polar. The Another way that is very similar, it is equivalent in many ways, but just a slightly different take on these ideas is to think about the grid lines associated with a coordinate system. 
So the grid lines for any given coordinate system are taken or, or rather are formed when you set the variables associated with that coordinate system equal to different constants. So the Cartesian coordinate system has variables x and y. If I set x and y equal to constants, I get these straight lines of this type. x equal to a constant, that gives me vertical lines. x equal to, if this is the y-axis here, this could be the vertical line x equal to one, this might be the vertical line x equal to two, and so forth. Whereas if I set y, my y variable equal to different constant values, I get different horizontal lines. So maybe this is y equal to zero, the x-axis, and this could be y equal to one, and down here we've got y equal to negative one, for instance, and so forth. But this is the grid that the Cartesian coordinate system imposes on the plane. In some sense, this is the filter through which the Cartesian coordinate system views the plane. This is its way of divvying it up. This is its way of classifying the points in the plane. This is its way of sort of dividing the world. How does it see the world? What is its fundamental perspective? We see it here in the grid line, in the grid lines for the Cartesian coordinate system. If we do the same thing for polar, when we set r equal to constants in polar, if I take r equal to one, I'm asking for all points that are a distance one from the origin. That's gonna give me a circle centered at the origin. If I set r equal to two, I get a larger circle, for instance. So when I set the r variable in polar equal to some constant, I get circles centered at the origin. When I set the theta variable equal to some constant in polar, I get these angle lines, which we have also called half infinite radial rays. So if I set theta equal to zero, I am getting the positive x-axis. I say rotate through an angle of zero from the positive x-axis, and because I have not specified the r value, I'm taking points any distance from the origin. So I'm getting the whole positive x-axis here. This line might be theta equal to pi over four. This is theta equal to pi over two. This is theta equal to three pi over four. Here we have theta equal to pi, and here we have theta equal to, what is it? Uh, so five pi over four, yes. Sorry, it's late in the day here, folks. This would be theta equal to five pi over four. So this is the way that the polar coordinate system fundamentally views the plane. It sees circles and half infinite radial rays where the Cartesian port coordinate system sees horizontal lines and vertical lines. So again, the purpose of all of this is just to try to develop the intuition of sort of what is the nature of these coordinate systems? What kinds of regions will be well expressed? Because what kinds of regions fit well within the way that this coordinate system views the space here, the plane? So these are our grid lines for polar, we've seen grid lines for rectangular and polar. Next time we meet, so on Friday, we will have, we will begin to think about how to compute integrals over regions when those regions are expressed in polar. So the idea is that I could ask you to integrate over a disk of radius two, for instance. If you try to do that in Cartesian coordinates, as we see, it's going to be bad. It's not going to be easy to integrate over that region because you end up with a bunch of square roots involved as you try to think about y going from the opposite of the square root of two minus x squared up to the positive square root of two minus x squared, for instance. And square roots are generally not something that we play with unless we have to. We tend to avoid them if we can because they complicate expressions. But if this region is instead expressed in polar coordinates, then the integral over that region is going to become relatively trivial. In fact, as easy as integrals in Cartesian over rectangular regions in Cartesian were, where we just had constant limits of integration for both of our integrals, the same will be true in polar. So if you're integrating over a polar rectangle in polar coordinates, all of your limits of integration turn out to be constants. You can change the order of integration freely. It'll be nearly as easy as our first considerations of double integrals in rectangular coordinates were. So thank you folks for your attention and we will pick this topic back up again on Friday. Have a good rest of your day.